I grew up in the south coast of England, uh, near, not far from the sea. Um, I was born in, in a place near Brighton, um, which is um, quite known for being involved with music quite a lot. Um, back in the day, it was like a big, big mod place. My father was a, was a heavy, heavily, heavily into being a mod. He had all the, the Vespa, the jacket, everything. So um, I kind of had music in the background from the beginning. And then uh, my family moved to uh, into another county next door called Kent. There was um, quite a big kind of uh, free party scene that went on down there. So when the rave scene started kicking off, that was kind of some of my first experiences of, uh, of encountering dance music. And now I'm here. <laughs> I just came across um, Radio 1 one evening and it was Pete Tong and it was called The Essential Selection back then and he was playing this rave music basically like the, the old school hardcore stuff and I was like yeah this sounds pretty cool and I didn't, so every week after that I would tune in and I'd had no idea what, it, what it was, this music was called but I just really liked it. I, I don't know what it was but it was just the whole kind of energy and just it felt like you were part of this huge movement so when you went out there was just this whole buzz and vibe and energy about the place and just to kind of see and witness some of those things was, was pretty incredible and that, that's kind of really when I got the bug to, to start wanting to actually DJ in clubs myself. I was watching Top of the Pops one day which was like a TV programme we had, like a chart programme and they'd play stuff that was in the charts and the, the performers would go and perform live on television and it, it would go, you know, they'd beam it all around the country. And um, there was a Public Enemy run and Terminator X was scratching. I was like, that was pretty interesting, I might give that a go. <laughs> so I grabbed one of my dad's kicks out of his and scratched it off on his record deck and, and basically ruined it. <laughs> Kill me. <laughs> Kill me. So my first experience with DJ was a very pleasant one. But um, I kind of, like about 10 years later, I actually found an, uh, an original copy of that. So I bought it for him and gave it back to him and he was quite pleased. I kind of bought my first set of decks around the age of 16. Um, saved up for them for about two years. <laughs> They had these little belt drive things and I was pushing around and stuff and I was trying to work out why it wasn't getting in time. And I didn't really start playing out in clubs until I was probably about 18, 19. Um, and they were li really literally things that, um, through people that I'd met in the record shops, like they decided to put on their own party and all the guys, all the local regular faces would just basically go and play. And then all our friends would come and that would make it, you know, so it was like, you know, 100, 150 people, like at best. You know, and that's if we'd done a promotion properly. <laughs> so it's like, you know, that's kind of really, really, really where it all began. So. I wasn't playing, I was always travelling back down to London and going to clubs like Ministry of Sound and just being blown away by the whole atmosphere really and just in complete awe of all these people around me that looked like 20 years older than me and like dressed up and or not dressed up and you know your first experiences are always the ones that stay in your memory the most. So now when I try and go out and play I try and emulate that all the time, not just for myself but also for the people in, in the club. I actually quite enjoy and watching the kind of politics of the dance floor, so to speak. Um, you know, watching the kind of psychology of people arriving, checking out the club, do it, sorting out their coats, going to the bar, getting a beer, you know, the guys on one side, the girls on the other, the girls start moving in a little bit to the floor, you know, the guys start moving in again, like to see them, you know. It's, it, it really does, it sounds really obvious, but it, it's true. You see that happening from where you are. You know, and the people on the floor don't really necessarily see that. So if you can kind of start bringing those people on there and keep them there, then you know that's really when you know that you're kind of starting to connect with them. And then over the period of that hour and a half, two hours or three hours, however long I'm playing, basically there will be a start, a middle and an end. There's a logical process to the way I'm playing. Um, and there's a logical way where the, the set will, it will start lower and it will finish higher. But it, again, it also depends on who's coming on after me. So, you know, I don't finish it too high. It, you know, if the DJ is coming on after me, he's also playing for another three hours because you know you don't want to burn people out too much. And at the end of the day, some of the reasons why the majority of the people are in those clubs is because of that that headlining DJ. So you have to kind of respect that as well. But I don't know, sets they always go like that, and they sometimes go like that. 
all at the same time. <laughs> it's probably the easiest way to describe it, I'll get like a diagram yeah. or something. <laughs> I do a lot of support work for people like Carl. In that instance, I, know, I just keep it really deep and really laid back, keep the BPMs really low. Um, and then when Carl comes on later on, he can then come on and basically go wherever he wants because, you know, the BPM's low enough and the music's at a sensible level so that he can, if he wants to keep it at that level, he can. If he wants to increase it, he can. You know, he can just do what he wants. I just bumped into Carl at this event in Holland given him a CD, he didn't really think too much of it, it was some of the first few productions I'd ever made um, and they, they, he liked it enough to want to put it on his label so um, we did a release for the label, about a year later the, the label manager said that um, he was leaving and would I like to be put forward for the role and I, I got the job and we started working together and it just kind of clicked from there really. We just realised that we had a lot of kind of common interests in terms of how we, you know, we like music to be portrayed, um, how to present it to people, how to make sure that people get the best enjoyment out of it that they possibly can. Um, we've since slowed the label down a little bit, and it's a, a bit of a break. And since then, you know, my own production has increased as a result. And and Carl asked me to to join him on certain aspects of his tours when he when he's touring around the world, and you know, it's great. Three of us go out with his tour manager Ian's there as well, and he's just you know. Like three boys out on the lash. <laughs> well, it's not really, but you know what I mean. It's like it's good fun. <laughs>